edition of Forager's Broadcast, otherwise known as Live Herbal Question and Answers, where we take discussions and uh, any herbal questions that anybody has out there available. So, uh, many blessings on this holiday time. I'd love to discuss some holiday aspects. Welcome, welcome, friends. Um, I'd love to discuss some kind of holiday mythologies, perhaps some revamping of mythologies, um, looking at what is the nature of myth and the necessity for developing myths, and kind of what happens to our culture when we don't have a sense of myth. Um, what is a culture where uh, rationalism becomes the myth? Um, that's a really important factor. Welcome, welcome everyone. So uh, feel free to connect up, uh, send any questions, and we'll try to address them live. What's up, Ian? Welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining in. So just a little bit about my own process the last couple of days. Um, I have been kind of feeling a, a respiratory issue come on um, with some post-nasal drip as I was uh, sleeping, and kind of like building up, really getting quite mucusy. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what I've been doing about that since it is the season, uh, not only the season for um, fighting over uh, religious beliefs and uh, the meaning of Christmas and how that interacts with uh, Christianity and the like, but also uh, cold and flu season. So, <clears throat> welcome, welcome everybody. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm really a big fan of is, like, what I do for myself is start hitting large amounts of my own elder elixir, which I make, as well as reishi tincture. Um, this is all wildcrafted, the reishi that I've harvested myself over the last two years or so. And I'll hit that pretty regularly for myself. Uh, this, I Every time I go to my apothecary, I fill up this jar. And uh, I'll hit about three droppers full every three hours. So reishi is one of those really helpful immunomodulating herbs, but it's not necessarily one of those herbs that you take when you're sick. You take it to build your immune system over a long period of time. So since I've made, uh, I made about two gallons of reishi tincture, and I've been hitting it really hard. Um, and it feels like a, a real deep restoration. <clears throat> so a lot of elder elixir... Um, I recommend be careful about elderberry syrups, etc., which have white sugar as their base, because how could that possibly be healing for your immune system if the white sugar is not only rancid, but also very unhelpful for an immune system, so things to be mindful of. Um, the other thing I was hitting is my own uh, cat's claw spagyric that I made. So this is uh, more potentized, so just a dropper full every you know three to six hours. And then um, I was also hitting burdock root tincture. So those kind of varying throughout the day. You know, the burdock is helpful for stimulating liver uh, digestion, etc. Um, eating a lot of kimchi, got lots of ferments going, uh, drinking spring water on the regular, of course. And another uh, <clears throat> ally is uh, shilajit, otherwise known as in Russia as mumio. Uh, it's very hard to kind of find a good quality of it. If you just start looking online, you might uh, get some bunk garbage. But really good uh, source of minerals as well as fulvic and humic acid. So if you see what I'm doing for my own personal self, I'm kind of varying up uh, a large uh, width, you know, instead of this idea of like, oh, well, I went to the health food store and I got cold and flu formula and I nursed it. Uh, and and people don't really take enough generally, especially for uh, colds and flus. And then on top of that, um, I'm drinking herbal teas all day. And this, uh, I really felt called to take oregano. Uh, what else is in here? <coughs> you can hear him still having fun. <clears throat> oregano, fennel, tulsi was the combination I put in here. Um, so that on the regular, really just tonifying and the oregano uh, uh, constituents just really numbing as well as um, kind of reducing any sort of bacteria or virus growing in the throat area. So that as a whole is a protocol that I've been doing each day. 
um, as well as eating well and avoiding mucusy foods and all things like that. So a lot of people I find don't really get what it takes um, as far as dosing, as far as self-dosing. When it comes to colds and flu, so generally if you go to a health food store and you buy a two ounce tincture, if you have a cold or flu like, like you know, I almost am getting, then that two ounce bottle probably is going to be empty in two days, you know, uh, if you're a 150 pound person, generally. So, this uh, herbal broadcast is brought to you by the power of oregano, tulsi, and uh, fennel. Really great herbs. Another thing I do is overnight, uh, I'll keep a couple uh, cardamom pods, and if it really gets itchy or I feel um, like I need to cough all night, if you chew cardamom pods and just kind of keep them in your gums and chew a couple of the seeds uh, every time you kind of wake up, it really helps to coat the throat and numb it and stop that cough reflex. So you could also try that with clove, but it would be much stronger and it'll make your mouth really numb. So you don't want to chew on it a lot. But that's kind of an interesting uh, practice to consider is like, you know, sometimes I've taken a slice of ginger or a slice of turmeric and just like put it in my gums and then just chew on a little nibble at a time. So that's really another uh, in, in important insight. Jesse mentions what's good for sinus cold. So that that I mentioned would be helpful in any case. Um, if you don't have cat's claw spagyric, of course, you can work with just cat's claw una de gato in any form. It's a very wonderful herb uh, for colds and flu, <clears throat> especially with the uh, lymphatic tonifying aspects. So when I'm dealing with a formula, I consider, you know, what's going to deal with the virus or the bacteria, so to speak, and what's going to help open and stimulate flow within my system. So those are both really important because you want to be urinating out um, dead bacteria. So the body actually does the healing, right? Think of it like that. Your immune function is what kills, isolates, targets, and kills viruses and bacteria that are foreign. The more you uh, expose your, or I, I just was listening actually to Daniel Vitalis and Arthur Haynes, and uh, they, they brought a word for this concept, which is called hormesis, which I'm enjoying. So um, check that podcast out and check out the concept of hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S, -S, I believe. Let's do a quick search here. <clears throat> and so that's basically the idea that on any level, yes, that's spelled correctly, on any level, if you expose yourself over time to a s small amount, uh, but a significant amount of, be it pollen, <clears throat> be it microbes, um, the body tends to build immunity around those substances, so if they ever got to a high load, the body was ready, and that's basically the concept behind vaccinations, that's the f whole philosophy of uh, homeopathy, so that's a kind of low-dose exposing, um, that's why I'm a huge fan of make-your-own-do-it-yourself uh, wild ferments, because I feel like when we consume those ferments, and even when we make those in our own household, we are having this safer interface of potential viruses or bacteria that are in the air and the atmosphere, which in micro doses get sort of exposure into that bacterial culture, which is safer because one, it's actually um, a salt water environment. So that stops already certain bacteria and viruses from growing uh, within itself. Uh, then the other factor is it's getting this huge flush of bacteria. And each of those bacteria are indeed intelligent and are analyzing the DNA of everything that comes into it. So if it's pollen or mold or, you know, whatever you're allergic to, in that the bacteria are really breaking it down through the process of fermentation, um, uh, studying and analyzing the DNA code behind those substances, and then you're consuming that, and that wisdom is being transferred not only into your gut bacteria, but also into your overall immune function. So it's a really important thing to consider uh, how to build resilience, and that's something we've really lost, especially in the idea of 
you know, only treat yourself, even if it's herbs, uh, once you're sick. You know, this is this is allopathic methodology um, applied to herbalism, and it's really unfair in a way because, you know, to build immune function, to build health. As I'm saying, the body is the true healer. The herbs help support that, or the pharmaceuticals help support that. The pharmaceutical is still creating a certain physiological effect, and your body has to do all that work, right? Um, so, you know, we want to expose it and give it an awareness. So, imagine a study that observes, well, who has more allergies, people who have outdoor jobs, or people who sit in offices in forced air conditions? So... That would be a nice study just to reveal the idea of like, well, the more you reduce your exposure to the natural world, the more you'll get sick from it, you know, and what a what a scary, sad thought that is. Uh, that's not very different than a human lab rat, you know, if being exposed to nature causes you to get sick, you know, uh, so we don't want that process to occur. Most of you listening and who are going to listen probably want to go the other direction. So fermented foods is a great way of getting that exposure, uh, that analysis um, of varied bacteria, micro amounts of potentially molds uh, or viruses. And I think that's ultimately a huge key to why we're becoming so sick in the modern world. Um, if I had an evil plan, it would be something like, well, get people convinced that they're insides are impure speaking of holiday season <laughs> get people convinced that in the bowels of themselves are demons and that's one phase of our evolutionary understanding uh, we can generally call that religion and then let's move from that to the fear that that those demons are something like germs or bacteria um, <clears throat> which moves us into the technological or uh, uh, industrial age and then let's sell people products which are bacteria killers, which end up, of course, going into their system and causing massive die-offs of the bacteria which are essential for their survival. If I had an evil plan, that's what it would be. So it's a really odd coincidence, to say the least, that that is uh, the state of the human condition and we know how many people or pharmaceutical industries or... Uh, other industries uh, are making tons of money, coincidentally, off of that process. So even if it's human error, and even if you're curious and listening, um, trying to get yourself exposed to soil, to leaves, to nature, to oxygen, to fresh air, all of those things um, is really going to uh, help you. <clears throat> so with that, um, I'd like to open up any questions that any of y'all have. I'd love to talk about uh, kind of holiday understanding and what I did during the solstice with some really good people. Happy late solstice, by the way. And uh, <clears throat> join in the fun. So another uh, great book uh, I just started reading is um, a second part series called uh, Romancing the Shadow, which is a really uh, insightful book so far. Um, the first one is actually called, uh, let's see, can't find it right now, um, but the same author, uh, Connie Zwig, Z-W-E-I-G, and it's basically about shadow work, and it's really interesting because that basically is the whole thing of the solstice. The idea um, is that the solstice is uh, the time when we go from more and more darkness to uh, opening up to our light. And that is a cosmic thing, and that is an individual thing, that is a political thing. Um, and that, of course, was for a long time the end of the year. And so December 22nd, would have been New Year for many cultures in the world. Um, and that would begin this, you know, going within and hibernation and then coming out in the spring and growing. So really amazing kind of insightful uh, pers <clears throat> perspective that oddly um, what we would call oversimplify as paganism 
is actually quite nature-based, um, meaning that they got a lot of biological science indeed right. Of course, we know there are <clears throat> two um, traditions of astrology. Uh, we call them uh, sidereal and tropical. Very oddly enough, uh, one of them is astronomically correct, and one of them is astronomically incorrect. So we have these two traditions. Uh, very oddly enough, the one that's not astronomically con correct is one that comes much later. So sidereal um, is a much older practice, so you get Tibetan astrology, Chinese astrology, um, most commonly Jyotish or Indian astrology, which is all based on fixed points, stars, <clears throat> and the moon, um, which is, you know, uh, in a relationship with the earth that is very fixed or consistent, we should say. We don't have a leap, leap moon, right? But we do have a leap year. And this is because um, Ptolemy brought a sort of new tradition which birthed things like the Gregorian calendar. And we went from a lunar kind of perspective into a solar perspective, and that kind of astrology is based on the sun. So the problem with that is um, there are some calculations that are not so systematically um, fixed, right? So the moon cycle is 28 days, and that is a really fixed situation. And so if you build an astrological and astronomical uh, mathematical calculating system off of uh, the moon cycle, then you get a very uh, accurate perception. So if you do the other side, um, you eventually get a sort of, if you're off by a fraction, you start getting wobbles. And so I think it's something like every four years, right? We have to have a leap year to just kind of recalculate the year. Um, so there are lots of cultures that still hold to the moon calendar. It actually ends up being a 13 moon calendar. So 28 divided uh, by 13. <clears throat> Anybody got that? So, um, yeah, that all ends up being really part of uh, an understanding of the basis of the winter solstice. So, or both solstices, because what you end up getting is you get this astronomically and astrologically linked um, phenomena, which means that the solstice, the winter solstice and the summer solstice are always going to be on the same day. Um, because it's based on fixed mathematics and it's quite accurate mathematics. So it's really interesting that we then look at something like the Gregorian calendar, which, you know, has different days, um, all these kinds of factors in it, which are completely um, fic uh, varied. You know, uh, one month has 27 days, one month has 32 days. So <clears throat> there's a lot there. Um, solstice is a really powerful experience. What we did was... Um, a friend from Olga, uh, from Antinanko Earth Arts School, had a gathering, and she got everyone to uh, get reclaimed boughs from trees that had been cut and trimmed, and we made an herb spiral in her front yard, and we w made candles. She is a candle maker, so she taught everybody to make candles, and then we went uh, into the spiral, lit the light, and then we came back out, and we put the light wherever we felt called to. And it, we said had different times where we said whatever we felt. And that's a really great baseline for kind of resacralizing some of the cultural aspects, community aspects um, that we have lost as far as being sacred. Um, it's like we don't want a religious situation, many of us, but we do want sacred situations. So uh, we'll talk about that more and uh, we'll take some questions as I'm seeing. Uh, Melanie, what's up, asks, uh, I have a couple small Ziploc bags of dried cut-up reishi I found in the woods a couple years ago. 
Do I think it's still good to use? Yeah, I do. I think Rishi will last a really long time, especially if it's not in a powder. Of course, powder is always a degraded form of herbs, which will only last maybe one year, maybe two years. <coughs> Some is always better than none, right? So if you slice them and they're in chunks, uh, that's a good thing. I always recommend with finding Rishi that you want to harvest and that you feel called um, it's the right time to harvest and the right situation and the right amount. Um, slice them when they're fresh into kind of, uh, you know, a couple millimeter thick slices and then dry them. And that's going to make them a lot easier to uh, uh, pound up later. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I think they're totally fine. And from there you could put them in a coffee grinder um, and grind them up or you can put them in uh, any sort of, you know, mortar and pestle and or a Vitamix or anything like that, and then you work with them ground. So uh, it's always good to think about if you can, if you have the tools, uh, get things broken up into pieces, and then you break down or grind down in, into flour for two months. You know, that's kind of my method. So if I'm dealing with even oats, I'll have lots of oats, and I'll I'll grind down about two months worth of oats at a time and this way the flour doesn't sit around which ca causes severe rancidity um, and is a big issue with why people are allergic etc. Hey Beth, um, she says, sorry you're sick Dan, just a little uh, phenomena, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say sick. Oh yeah, Patrick mentions uh, brewed fes fresh ginger is also really effective. Yeah, uh, definitely one thing that anybody can do is slice ginger, uh, maybe about a thumb size, in two to four cups of water. Slice ginger and simmer it down for 10-15 minutes. From there, you'll have the base, like think of that as a soup broth. <clears throat> and then what I'll do is turn the uh, fire off and get a lid, and then I'll crumple up whatever it is oregano say in this case or tulsi or fennel and then you put them all in that hot liquid and put a put a lid on and just let that steep for 10 minutes 20 minutes then you have all that ginger as the base of your tea but you also have all those herbs that's a really great way of making a nice uh, healthy healing herbal tea melanie mentions uh drinking a lot of hibiscus flower tea and find that helps definitely uh high vitamin c uh, plants at this time is really good, helpful for us. Um, Vance mentions, what's my opinion on taking sagebrush? And by, there are a lot of different kinds of plants that we call sage. Uh, commonly, garden sage is the one that we get in the store or cook with. And then we have um, <clears throat> artemisias, right? Those are all salvias. And then we have artemisias. Uh, and out of that we have things like mugworts and we also have sage brushes so those all have the genus Artemisia so let's see this one this is probably a, a, a Artemisia uh, thinner smaller leaves or this which you're probably familiar with this is actually a salvia salvia appiana so this one, of course, is the one always uh, in controversy over. Um, also a very good respiratory medicine is just to burn a little bit. So uh, white sage, as it's known, is the one that there's a lot of controversy over because of the fact that it grows in a very small region. And uh, <clears throat> that's it gets over-harvested. A lot of people uh, in California you know, live in their vans and harvest white sage and make a living selling it to head shops and things. So, but as far as working with any sage brushes, usually they're more common and uh, less of an issue. So when I was out in California, uh, Artemisia californicum uh, is one of the wild sage brushes out there and it's beautiful. Uh, also called cowboy cologne, as we learned. So that's a really, um, great herb as well as you know I've talked a lot about mugwort Artemisia vulgaris that one also is a great burning herb but that one actually can be a little irritating on the respiratory system I found Patty mentions rest helps and I just want to remind everybody um, that we're supposed to change uh, our patterns and our energy levels uh, 
throughout the seasons and having fossil fuel heat is uh, sometimes a fossil fuel temperature house really gets us to forget that we are supposed to have different eating habits in the season, different sleep habits in the season, all kinds of things like that. So don't forget um, it's really important to sleep and believe me I'm a big fan of sleeping. Uh, I really don't have any qualms with sleeping um, <clears throat> as a practitioner of yoga or as an herbalist. Sleep is very important as well as dreaming, as well as dream interpretation, uh, as well as really working with our dreaming and altered states of consciousness are found through uh, the dream world. So they're all very important factors for health, well-being, and um, definitely chilling out. I think that's the number one thing. It's like if you want to continue the same workload but take an herb to heal your six-month cough, it's just not going to work. That's just not how it works. Um, the cold is getting there because of patterns. And if we're not willing to change those inherent patterns that is running down our immune system, then indeed we're not going to heal. Um, another herb I just thought of, which uh, I have one here that I got from a friend, which has, has been with me for about two years. Um, one of a really profound uh, sweat lodge inipi that I... Uh, attended was uh, the the elder there he actually uh, not only put white sage on the coals but he also put small amounts of osha or bear root um, that was a really profound respiratory opener so I burn a just a tiny bit um, if I have a respiratory issue or I feel like I need to open my breathing and that's also really helpful so that white sage and the osha together just small amounts can really be helpful and not only helpful for your respiratory system but also for the environment um, you know when you're coughing or you're blowing your nose all over the place you do get uh, viruses or bacteria spread and just burning smudge actually is medicinally effective for treating and dealing with your environment. Um, I think it's very obvious that soon we will have a scenario where uh, the world will look at um, <clears throat> the bacteria in and around us as a kind of aura. It will actually substantiate the idea of the aura because what we really would see if we can see the bacteria is that every time I move my hand I'm sloughing bacteria. You know, um, spores is another thing. You know, you know how many spores are just floating around the atmosphere. So every time you move, every time you go in the forest, you're changing the wind directions as a result of your movement and, you know, interacting spores and interacting um, <clears throat> bacteria, microbes. So when I hugged Paul Stamets at the International Herb Symposium, I really felt like I was uh, getting an initiation from his spora. That was what uh, the cosmic joke was. Billy mentions, how's the book coming along? Um, really well, really excited uh, to basically hibernate for the first time in a lot of years and just have consistent Wi-Fi and all the goodies of the modern world to just uh, get a book out by spring of 2017. Um, really excited about that. Uh, I haven't released the title yet. I'm really holding that title because I think it's so good that uh, I just want to build the anticipation. Haha. -ha. So it's about 70% done. I'm working with an editor actually, so really excited about that. And uh, you know that's going to be phase two, basically, of the van project, which is coming uh, closer and closer. Looking at this uh, van, I'm a little hesitant because I can't find any vans with all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive, so I'm a little concerned because the whole plan was to be able to park uh, down any dirt road and sleep in the van. So that's not going to happen with real-wheel drive, apparently, so I'm trying to feel that out. Um, so if anybody's not familiar out there, I have a GoFundMe campaign, which is almost to its goal. Um, at return to nature uh, gofundme.com backslash return to nature and uh, you can also see it on my website and uh, my pages and we have raised over nine thousand five hundred dollars and if you're you know looking for 
goodies for your friends and family over the holiday time. We have a lot of herbal rewards, they're called, on GoFundMe, which are basically just we have tea blends, we have tinctures, we have package deals, we have t-shirts available, herbal consultations with me, all kinds of things up there. So if you're interested in supporting a local movement um, as well as you know, healing and getting your friends herbal goods and things like that, uh, consider checking that out. We're almost to the goal. Hopefully that'll come in soon. I'll be looking probably next week at this van again, seeing if it's the right one, uh, visioning a lot for how to put the shelving up um, and how to stock it with uh, herbal remedies so and food, you know, s supplies, as well as we're going to put a solar panel on the roof so that I'll have solar for any laptop or cell phone and, um, you know, just deck it out with herbal goodies so that as I travel, um, which will only be really small jaunts, it's not like I'll be driving uh, pretty much like two hours a day is my limit. I was in a band for eight years and I felt like all we did was drive and I really hated it so much that I left the band. Um, I like camping. I like going slow. I like visiting parks. So that's my speed. So two hours driving the most per day, um, you know, is my max. And then what I do now is probably more like two hours per week. You know, I'll move my whole world um, and then live out of a different place for two weeks and then move my whole world again. So uh, driving will become less and less as I have a mobile storage unit to put dry goods and so many things. I'm always, I feel like plant a cloth. I'm always moving stuff around. Um, Dasha mentions, do I make oregano oil myself? No, I do not. I find that it's one of the strongest medicines that works for me when I'm coming down with something. I'm not a big fan of oregano oil. Uh, I don't recommend it unless you have MRSA or SARS. If you have a cold, um, I feel like we all need to learn a little more about herbal medicine so we can avoid uh, using essential oils at every little bout. Um, the reason is because they're incredibly antimicrobial and they will actually screw up the gut bacteria. So we need to be really careful for ingesting essential oils, just like we need to be really careful when we resort to antibiotics. Um, antibiotics also kill off gut bacteria. Herbal tea does not. So I would much prefer putting oregano in my soup putting oregano in my smoothie, putting oregano in tea, um, versus taking uh, essential oil oregano of oregano, which is very harsh. Um, if you can't put it in your mouth, it's obviously going to burn your mucous membranes, and it cannot break down because it already is an essential oil. So um, <clears throat> I don't recommend anyone, if you can help it, to take essential oils um, unless you really have found that nothing else can work. Um, so as I mentioned, the tinctures that I'm taking, as well as the teas, that should be surely sufficient to deal with a little cold versus um, overdoing it, as many people do, with oregano oil or um, colloidal silver. That said, I also just want to remind you that there are no health benefits to taking something like oregano oil daily. It is not tonifying to the immune system. It is not going to help you. Um, it will eventually cause problems in the intestines or in the esophagus, um, as well as kill off lots of bacteria that need to be there. So everybody just really be careful on overuse of essential oils or overuse of colloidal silver. Um, as I mentioned, I'm serious when I say, like, have some on hand. If there's a pandemic, I'm going to be spraying oregano oil all over the place. Um, it is a beautiful medicine for its time and place. However, a little head cold is not the time and the place if we have um, herbal wisdom to be careful. So, you know, as I mentioned, those things, the more we grow and the more we learn, the less we might need uh, to dose ourselves on such heavy uh, things. That said, it's way better than taking uh, antibiotics, you know, but don't forget, they cause, I mean, they'll give you anti, they'll pull your tooth and give you antibiotics just in case you get an infection, you know, so that's a world that I don't want to really engage in. Um, Bridget mentions, happy solstice, uh, what foods cause mucus buildup and what herbs are best for getting rid of mucus? Um, we need mucus. We don't want to necessarily get rid of mucus. Think about it as we need a 
uh, uh, of viscosity. And the foods that we consume uh, changes our mucus viscosity. You need your, inte uh, your intestines as well as your sinuses lined with mucus. It's very important. Consider that if you dry your mucus out, as is also a common thing, you know, take clays and take this and sterilize yourself from the inside out and be convinced you have parasites and just doing all that harsh treatment can also make it so that the bacteria can die because if you consider uh, when you water seeds in the ground, they have to stay moist. You can't overwater them, but you can't let the ground dry out either. So we need that right kind of pH as well as moisture level. Um, simply foods that cause mucus, anything that like cold dairy is probably the number one culprit of mucus forming. Sugar, um, as well as wheat, you know, a lot of times wheat uh, can cause issues, mucus issues for people. So those are a couple, you know, cold dairy, uh, you know, in Ayurveda they say warm, if you're going to drink milk, warm it up and put a pinch of cardamom, turmeric, anything like that just to cut down the mucus. Um, so I really don't mess with a lot of dairy uh, in this season, and uh, especially if I'm feeling like this. Otherwise, you know, um, that's a bit. And then herbs for kind of clearing out mucus. Um, you know, oregano oil. You think about principles. So think about oregano is burning, right? So think about that as a drying or dissipating right um burning so it kills bacteria it cleanses the system it makes you urinate it makes you you know really detoxify yourself so in that way it's going to help break up mucus um you know versus something like sassafras or slippery elm those will possibly help to increase mucus and as an herbalist there's a time for each of those and I think that's the problem when we we look to one solution, like, oh, well, more colloidal silver for everyone will just make everyone healthier. The problem is not everyone is the same person, so how could that possibly be true? Because we have different lifestyles, we have different gene pool, we have different uh, food habits, you know, we have different reactions to different substances, so different addictions, you know, so there is not one uh, method for each person. Um, Linda mentions, whenever I feel the tiny bit of a cold, I've eaten zinc. People swear by zinc. Definitely, uh, any info on zinc, uh, herbal equivalents? Well, uh, you know, what I would do there is I would always want to see what herbs or foods uh, are high in zinc. I never want to take uh, isolated uh, supplements if I can help it. There are some cases like... You know, if you're going vegan for the next 12 years, you're going to have to figure out how to take some isolated supplements. Um, if you do, I recommend food-based uh, vitamins, of which there are only a few. Um, but, you know, if you get something from GNC or something, it's not going to be very effective. Uh, so let me know, Linda, what your uh, source of zinc is. So I know that zinc is... So what I did was do top foods highest in zinc search... And I'm pretty sure pumpkin seeds, seafood is like the highest, beef and lamb, wheat germ, spinach, <coughs> pumpkin seeds, big fan of pumpkin seeds, cashews. Um, so, you know, I'll eat a lot of varied seeds and nuts, and I think that's really uh, helpful in those aspects. So maybe that might be soaked pumpkin seeds in a jar. Here's actually, you know, so this is uh, sprouting seeds, so I'm soaking them, I'll pour that out and then sprout those. So I like to eat a lot of living foods like that. Here's another buckwheat, all right? Um, so I'll take pumpkin seeds, put them in a jar, soak them overnight, strain that out, and then of course you can eat those as is. You can add them to your stir fries or anything like that. So, um, you know, zinc is helpful. Uh, understanding micro and macronutrients is helpful. Um, but I always want to tend towards trying to find them through foods because I know that my body understands those foods much better than uh, a pharmaceutic version of that, you, you know, or an isolated constituent from that. Um, Sanara mentions OSHA with local honey. Yum, yum, yum. 
Osha root slices with honey is really amazing. Although, uh, you know, Osha can have its issues. So we don't want to over harvest Osha and there's a lot of ethical harvesting issues for Osha. I found that, you know, uh, Mountain Rose, Frontier, etc. they don't even have Osha anymore. So that's showing that it's getting pretty bad. So if you have Osha uh, in a sustainable source, uh, you can always slice that up and put it in honey and let that sit for two weeks to a month, a moon cycle, um, and that's really beautiful. You just eat a slice of that. You can also do that with ginger. You can also do that with fresh turmeric, um, elecampane. That would be pretty spicy. But those all really help for sore throats, lungs, things like that. Um, echinacea is another one where if you like kind of drizzle it down your throat, it has those, uh, I forget what they're called, um, the other uh, herb that's somewhat similar to that is uh, spilanthes, right? Those are all really numbing. So a lot of times essential oils within the herb, right? So within the seed, like cardamom has cardamom essential oil, right? It comes from there. And when you chew that, those essential oils will coat the throat and you'll actually feel that numbing. So basically as long as you're getting that numbing, you're going to reduce, you know, you're actually doing allopathic treatment, which is you're going to reduce your spasms, right, for better or for worse. You don't want to suppress your symptoms. Um, coughing is how your body gets that mucus out, etc., um, all those kind of things. So Kyle mentions, would foraging be a potentially viable option for getting some fresh food on the trail while backpacking? Depends on the location, and it depends on the season. Um, <clears throat> food on the trail while backpacking. Any suggestions for plants in the Northeast? Um, you know, basically for living a wild diet while backpacking um, is something that I've tried to do for six to eight years. And what you end up doing is pretty much sitting still because if you're gonna get any serious real calories, you have to either get nuts or you have to start running after or trying to kill animals. You can eat greens and walk. Um, you can barely eat greens and sit on your computer. So you have to have the macronutrients. That's easy to debate when people are not really doing anything, but when you're chopping wood and carrying water and hiking seven miles and, and collecting wood for fire and not eating until you've collected that wood, um, it becomes really important to get fat, protein, and carbohydrates, which of course in the Northeast, there are almost zero fat sources of vegetables. Um, there is very few carbohydrate sources. So, you know, if you find a stand of burdock, right, if you find a stand of cattails, you can live on that. But why would you then leave? So, um, our ancestors were semi-nomadic for this reason, meaning that they would stay at a particular area that had these food sources available. They would work with those food sources to a certain degree and time and point, and then they would leave and move on and try to get to another uh, uh, place with those food sources. So it's pretty impossible to just wander and harvest enough food to not die. And what I mean by not die is that you're if you're spending more energy than you can get through your diet, if you give time as a factor, that's going to cause your death. Um, and that's a real issue of concern. So fat, protein, carbohydrates become your gurus. If you're trying to live a wild diet and go anywhere, it's very difficult, especially in the Northeast. If you live in an area which is endemic with fruits that are in season, that contain fat, then you have a greater chance. So Southern California hiking, much easier. Um, you know, New Jersey to Maine, uh, on a wild diet, you're going to have to spend probably three hours a day collecting, uh, leaching, and, uh, sorry, grinding and leaching acorns, but that's only available for a certain time. So what did indigenous people do they had acorns from last season and that means you're going to carry around 55 pounds of acorns along with your 65 pounds of gear so um, i hope everyone can see the humbleness in that practice it's really humbling and it definitely will change um, anybody's dietary restrictions very uh, humbly um, melanie mentions she had a lingering cough for months from a terrible cold Made a tea from these three herbs combined, 
from Agatha. My cough went away after a few days. Unfortunately, that's all the comments will show. Beth mentions, haha, planta class. Yeah, I definitely feel like planta class. I'm always moving herbs and plants and drying and playing with medicines. Um, Tony mentions, I've heard you can collect stardust off the coastal regions with a magnet. Are you familiar with this process? No, I am not. Um, however, I've actually collected some stardust here. And I don't mean to be a pain in the ass, but you see this? That's actually stardust. So I don't know exactly what you mean by stardust, meaning that everything sand is stardust, right? So anyone can pick up a whole handful of stardust anytime they pick up sand. Um, all of the minerals that exist on the planet were originated from the cosmos before there were any planets, um, including everything that your bones are made out of. So I am walking stardust. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure exactly what you mean by collecting stardust. Um, let me know. Tell me more. Stardust, Tony mentioned, stardust falls from the skies in the oceans and washes up on the shore. Well, it's hard to call it stardust versus, um, you know, is it atmospheric or is it um, extraterrestrial? It's very hard to d determine that. Um, we know uh, meteors come into the atmosphere, um, so, you know, it's not entirely impossible, um, possibly. But every bit of shell, right, that is broken down into a piece of sand, sand, uh, consists largely of rocks and shells and all of those are tumbled for millions and millions of years by the currents of the ocean but all of that originates as stars um, every bit of calcium or calcite that every shelled organism has ever sequestered came from outer space so it's really uh, good to consider uh, Billy mentions actually you can eat a lot of crickets and grubs um, yeah, so basically there are no vegetarian um, animals on the planet that don't eat bugs. Uh, their orangutan are said to be some of the most vegetarian animals on the planet. Um, they eat tons of bugs. I think it's something like 60 to 70 percent of their diet is insects. So if you want to eat a wild diet, you have to then become wild. You cannot continue eating a domesticated diet. Um, and getting the calories needed to survive and that's something that's really humbling It's not an easy process um, And it's been my journey. I mean I started foraging as a vegan and you can get a lot of greens You can eat dandelions out the wazoo, but the amount of fat in dandelions is zero And if you're burning fat you need fat, so it's just simple mathematics um, So, you know insects can be eaten um, animals right there are insects there are animals and there are plant sources out of that whatever you choose your diet to be you need fat protein and carbohydrates especially to live in the wild especially to have the energy to do anything other than sit there and of course order stuff you know uh from the internet um in in a living situation in the wild of course you're probably not going to be uh, ordering any fat from amazon.com so you're going to have to actually get it and if you look around and you learn your plants you'll learn really quickly that there's pretty much zero uh, fat out there pawpaws are the one exception and they have about a two week window for you to harvest enough pawpaws to live off of for the entire year um, and then from there they don't have a very good shelf life and they're very hard to store unless you have refrigeration or something um, so you know it's really amazing uh, as I mentioned you know nuts unfortunately are very heavy nuts weigh a lot so if you're gonna carry around enough nuts to eat for two weeks this is my whole reason for getting a van because all I want to do is live in a backpack and just wander around like a crazy hobo but I've realized that I cannot possibly forage or carry enough food to live like that without turning to animals you know and I've been a vegetarian for probably eight years so I know that whole deal but once you start to get into trying to live in the wild and not come back out and go to a grocery store and then go back in 
you start realizing, wow, you know, this is the process of starvation, and there's a reason that um, all of this is set up the way it has been, and why we've learned anthropological understanding from indigenous culture and everything like that. So, Tony mentions uh, it's not stardust, it's meteorite dust. It's pretty cool. So, I would imagine the meteorite dust is um, uh, magnetized. So, yeah, that's that's definitely awesome. I've never sat on the shore, and I guess that's what you'd have to do, right? You sit on the shore, you hold magnets, and you hope for the best. Um, I wonder how long you'd have to do that for it to be significant. So, something we could all check out. Um, thanks all for joining. Does anybody have any more questions? Feeling like my throat is uh, ready for resting. I really appreciate this time with you all. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about as far as uh, the pagan Catholic battle over Christmas and this time. And I think it's all really important for us to start realizing what is sacred and significant to us. Um, it's really interesting how, you know, um, maybe Catholics or Christians will say Jesus is the, the reason for the season. You hear that. Um, but actually, what does December 25th even have to do with Jesus? Uh, it's not his birthday. Um, so we have to understand, why is that so? And we have a whole history. Um, maybe I'll just drop a really good source. If you're interested in trying to understand how this all came to be, um, check out Manly P. Hall, which was an esoteric philosopher um, <clears throat> and wisdom keeper and share teacher. Um, and it's called The Solar Christmas. You know, it's funny, because if you saw the Zeitgeist movie, um, that basically is just some guy watching, like, mad YouTube videos and making, like, a documentary out of the stuff he watched. Um, so, Manly P. Hall, The Solar Christmas, it's on YouTube, really profound. And it talks a lot about, uh, he also has a lot of lectures about astrotheology, and um, some of those principles that were talked about in Zeitgeist, but much more elaborated and, you know, from the person himself. Yeah, so, um, a couple more questions. Alexander mentioned, do I feel that colonics dry the mucous membranes too much? Uh, <clears throat> colonics do completely get rid of all of, I wouldn't say all, but definitely uh, change your, you know, the bacteria in your intestines and basically flush them out and although there might be certain times for that like maybe a pre-crohn's tradition uh, uh, uh condition or something like that but i am not uh, a fan of the necessity of colonics i would consider that um that's all there for a pretty good reason um, I would do enemas. That feels like a healthier balance. Um, I wouldn't start messing with colonics unless I had some sort of real issue. Otherwise, you know, I think that we're going to learn more and more that, oh, shit, we actually need those intestinal bacteria, and they're not bad. And the way I feel like the way of treating bad bacteria or things like that is to have good bacteria. Um, just like the way of not getting sick is to treat your immune system now. Right? The best way of healing cancer is to not get it in the first place. So when we treat for health, then we don't end up in the place where candida is overrun. So, you know, avoid that gluten. If that's an issue, avoid sugar. Um, avoid, you know, the foods that cause those issues. Um, don't wait till you're sick. You know, that I think is the real message of the plants and of herbal teachings is that we nourish wellness, we don't treat sickness, you know, and that's uh, a, a much more important paradigm to consider. Um, so, <clears throat> Daniel mentions uh, how Amanita was hung from, so Amanita muscaria is the fly agaric mushroom. It happens to be red and white. There's lots of rumors going around. Everybody's all over the idea that Christmas is just one big fly agaric trip. We do have some interesting connections. There are a couple connections. Um, the Douglas fir is the tree. It's not actually a pine tree that we do bring in the house. The first question you should ask, why? Where does that tradition even come from, right? So that is definitely an accurate understanding. Like, why do you bring a tree in your house in the first place? What does that even come from? 
first of all, I think that's ecologically completely insane at this point uh, to cut and kill any trees. You know, that's not necessarily a good behavior that we should teach our, our next generations, but I'll save that whole preach. I started getting into that last time. You can see all the back issues of uh, these webcasts on re my Return to Nature page on YouTube. Uh, it's Return to Nature Skills on one page, uh, one sentence. Um, so then the idea that Amanita was hung from pine trees, or in this case, Douglas fir trees, to dry, maybe. And that's where decorated Christmas trees come from, maybe. Christmas ball balls, are they just drying Amanita muscaria mushrooms? Maybe. Um, presents under the trees this is coming like i saw david wolf's video today and it's just like completely assertive and completely like this is how it is and that's all obvious so a lot of this comes from one book it's john allegro it's called the mushroom and the cross um where he makes a lot of claims with no substantial evidence to back it up he's just basically like i know that this is true and here's what's true about it the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by John Allegro. I'm going to read it entirely. No, I'm not. Um, but in it, he talks about how the Pope is white and red, and he wears like a huge garb, and he's just nothing but Amanita muscaria. The very interesting thing is, if you want to assert these things, you should probably ask the Amanita muscaria itself. That would be a very important source. I think a lot of the people that are making these claims may have not actually done that so uh, that might be one fact checking um you know with the plant itself or in this case the mushroom amanita muscaria does have a symbiotic relationship with a douglas fir tree it does indeed grow out of the roots of the douglas fir tree so that is another factor that's very significant but we look at um Amanita muscaria grows under the Douglas fir tree. That's what we know. Okay? That's what we do know factually. So, where is all of the rest of the idea coming from? Um, you know, just make sure it's not coming from John Allegro's book. Or if it is, make sure you've actually read it. And if you have read it, just make sure he's actually providing some factual understanding. Um, I remember reading it when I was about 20, and I was like, that's cool, but this guy is like, I don't know, it's just one of those New Age books that's just like, this is the truth, the Lemurians said it, and that's it. And, like, I'm, it's going to take me a little more for that. So, um, there are some really important connections between Amanita Muscaria, the origins of religion, and the origins of Christmas. We should definitely be discussing it and looking into it. We should definitely not just assert anything that we uh, think. Um <clears throat> Daniel mentions reindeer are also part of that shamanic, archetypal, uh, Siberian culture. Now, um, it went from reindeer like to drink the urine of the shamans because musimol, uh, the active ingredient in fly agaric, is transferred out of the body. And so then there was probably an idea when the shaman were all uh, tripping on the Amanita muscaria that like ha 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 look the reindeer drink our piss and then they fly he 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 now it's turned in th thanks to the internet that shamans are drinking each other's piss and everybody's just having a piss drinking fest maybe you know be careful you're reading internet articles so yes reindeer are part of that iconography of Siberian shamanism they do have a tradition in Siberia of ingesting Amanita muscaria and flying, the fly agaric. That is definitely all um, anthropological evidence about uh, this mushroom with the tradition at hand. Um, Daniel mentions, which I agree with, I think Christmas is a conglomerate of a bunch of different things mixed together. Totally agree. Um, but taking the tree, trying to understand where the tree and that relationship to fly agaric comes in, that seems to be an aspect, possibly, of Siberian shamanism. Of course, which was snuffed out almost entirely by communism, um, they would actually, there's stories where they would take the region's uh, best shamans and they would fly them in an airplane, 
and they would say, so you can fly, huh? And they would throw them out of the airplane. That's what they did with shaman uh, during communism. So be careful about that. Awesome to hear uh, Alexander mentions eating soaked pumpkin seeds with my dinner. Great to hear. Um, always recommended to soak all nuts and seeds before you consume them. I'm also a big fan of fenugreek, so I've been uh, soaking fenugreek and then adding those. Uh, they're very good, uh, nourishing for the immune function. Uh, yeah, Alexander mentions uh, that he's heard that milk thistle can save your life from Amanita muscaria toxicity. Um, of course, there's some misunderstanding about Amanita muscaria being toxic. Um, it does have, uh, basically what happens is you have muscarine, um, and that gets converted to mucimol. There's ibotenic acid and muscarine are the known so-called toxic aspects, and then they're converted through heat into um, mucimol, which is, hi Margaret, which is the um, active ingredient, so to speak. Improperly prepared, it is said that um, you can vomit and also um, that it can be harsh on the stomach. Now, that is not necessarily poisonous. That is a normal night with ayahuasca. So that's not necessarily a uh, means to call it poisonous. Poisonous, I consider, means it will kill you, right? Um, there's some confusion, of course, even in field guides for mushroom hunting uh, about Watch out, you don't mistake uh, Amanita pantherina for Amanita muscaria. Of course, we don't have uh, the red fly agaric uh, in the northeast. We have an orange sunburst. It used to be called Amanita amara muscaria. Um, then it was Amanita muscaria var formosa. Those are all the same mushroom. Um, or let's say those are all the similar fly agaric of the, the east east coast. There's also confusion about dosages. There's also confusion about when to pick them. There's also confusion about variation of those dosages within season. Um, there's so much, I think, misinformation about Amanita muscaria tripping, uh, getting high from Amanita muscaria, because of uh, the propaganda against all of those substances. Yeah, Daniel mentions also another common name would be the yellow fly agaric. Um, and we don't want to mistake that for Amanita pantherina. That one can be deadly toxic. Um, but the milk thistle thing is actually said not to be uh, with fly agaric, which is generally safe uh, as far as toxic uh, substances that will kill you. But um, the milk thistle is actually said to be hepatoprotective against all mushroom poisonings in uh, the Amanita genus. I don't recommending uh I don't recommend you know doing that, so I don't know where that idea comes from, but it's in the literature and you'll you'll hear about that. Um Daniel mentions uh and don't mind my nitpicking, uh using this as an example. I just want to use it for shamanic purposes. Of course, if you want to have a shamanic purpose with a plant, you never use the ally. You never use your grandmother, you never use the elder you work with the elder humbly. And that will be the only way that we will get any sort of quote-unquote shamanic purpose uh, with a plant or a mushroom, is if we're in an understanding that we are small, and it is very old and very big, <coughs> and has a certain wisdom and a certain knowledge that we are hoping for, um, I find that that is uh, a pretty important way of engaging the plant teachers or the mushroom teachers. Uh, we have a cultural problem with using nature. Um, in essence, what human species has done, you know, in the last 10,000 years is chopped up little bits of nature, learned how to put them into coordinated packages, and sell them to each other. So when we deal with plants, we want to consider what is, what is the difference between using a plant versus working with a plant. And working with a plant means I understand you, plant, are way older than the human species. You've been here for a really long time. You have had immune system shifts and changes as a result to climate that I cannot even imagine. You are the elder. You are the teacher. I am the humble student. I don't know what I'm doing. You please help me. And that's my intention um, 
with working with plant teachers like that. And remember, some plants uh, yell and some plants whisper, but all plants talk. So uh, Alexander was referring to people unknowingly eating it raw without proper preparation. Yeah, if you eat Amanita muscaria raw, you'll probably vomit. Um, but again, that's not necessarily poisonous in the sense of you won't die from it necessarily. I don't know. Um, but it does not seem like there's any reported deaths from Amanita muscaria. Um, you could feel like you're dying, but then you're fine in six hours. Uh, the other factor of, you know, the experience of Amanita muscaria is not pleasant. I mean, it's legal because of that. Things that are really unpleasant and just not fun um, are actually legal. Um, <laughs> nice, Daniel mentions, I wish it to impart its epigenetic knowledge to me. That's a, a very nice way of saying it. I, uh, I appreciate that, and I'm sure they do as well. So, of course, Amanita muscaria is generally not around right now. But oddly enough, soon in the future, you could get your Christmas tree, or maybe you could just pick the Amanita muscaria from the Christmas tree lot. But, of course, they probably spray them with lots of toxins. So, glad to share a little bit about Amanita muscaria, uh, kind of uh, debunk some of those myths or those ideas. Definitely an important thing to talk about in our culture. We should maybe ask David Wolf where that video came. I saw that video today. I don't know if you did as well, but where the citing or the sources for those video assertions are. There are some really interesting connections. The idea of red and white Christmas balls uh, being drying mushrooms, uh, gifts under the trees in red and white uh, being Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Uh, interesting assertions, not necessarily proven in any way, shape, or form. So we should always ask questions and not be afraid to ask questions because those always lead to further discussion and the lack uh, and loss of living in the propaganda age where we're, uh, whatever occurs is uh, absolutely true because we want it to. And if you challenge us, we're too insecure to have a debate about it, so we'll just yell at you or beat you up. Um, we have to continually push against that being the trend of our cultural uh, endeavor. You know, very important. Very, very, very important. So uh, thank you all for joining. I wish you all uh, blessed holy days. I hope that you find your own sacred spiritual version of whatever holiday or holy day that you connect with. Um, if it's based on wishing people good and um, creating a sense of togetherness and family, then it, it indeed is good. And we need much more of that in this world. So Keep on shining your light however you do and however resonates for you. Let's continue to just discuss um, those kind of ideas. So feel free, of course, to join me on the Return to Nature page on Facebook as well as all my other crazy amounts of pages of Internet blasphemy. Um, thank you, friends. Sending lots of blessings. Happy Holy Days. Oh,